Hey everybody, how's it going? My name is Matt and today I thought I would discuss rifle scopes specifically for shooting precision rimfire competitions like NRL 22 or here in Canada, the CRPS and ORPS series. I've seen this question asked a lot both online and in person, so I figured I'd make a quick video and highlight features you really wanna look for when you're looking for a scope to shoot these matches with. Perhaps you're building your first rifle, your first setup, and you might be a little bit overwhelmed and confused because I know the market is quite saturated with different optics so again, this video will hopefully help someone out there. I do want to be clear though, you don't need to spend any money off the bat. If you haven't shot a match yet, just go out with what you have. You can use your grandpa's 10-22 and even shoot open sights just to get a feel for how the matches are and if it's something you really want to invest money in. So the way I'm going to present this video is as I talk about the different features in a rifle scope, I'm going to kind of categorize them into different categories. So the first one is going to be things that I would deem necessary, something you definitely want to look for in a scope to be as competitive and effective as possible and in the shooting discipline. The second category is going to be the nice to have stuff which um, might make your experience shooting the matches a little bit better but won't necessarily give you an advantage over anything else. And then the third category is going to be situational items that might be very beneficial for certain shooters but for other shooters it might not be worth spending the extra money in order to acquire those features. So you'll probably see during some matches that some people run really high-end scopes. I'm talking scopes that are well above a few thousand dollars. And in my opinion, uh, that's totally fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If that's within your budget and you enjoy using that glass, all power to you. I think that's really awesome. But don't feel like you need to spend such a high price point on a scope in order to acquire something that checks off all the boxes in order to give you a very competitive setup. This here is a Diamondback Tactical, and this represents an entry-level scope that is very high value. It's very popular for a good reason because it does check basically most if not all the check boxes you would want in a very competitive rifle scope and it holds its own in competition with some of the much higher uh, end scopes out there. Now obviously using a much higher end scope might be a better experience. You might get a sharper image, you might have better feeling turrets, a uh, few more features built into it, but in terms of actually being competitive there are many good shooters that use the Diamondback Tactical and you can tell just by their score obviously that they're not at a disadvantage at all using something like this. So don't think you have to buy a super high end scope in order to be competitive in this shooting discipline. This guy here is my current uh, rifle scope setup. This is the Vortex Strike Eagle. It's not mounted on my rifle at the moment because I used the scope base on my wife's CZ and I'm waiting for a new one to come in um, for my rifle. But this is going to represent a higher end rifle scope that has everything the Diamondback Tactical has but a few more bells and whistles on top of that that might not be necessary for you to spend the extra money to acquire because again you're not going to be able to score more points that way but it will be a nicer experience to shoot with this rifle scope um, just a little bit more um, high end. I have another rifle scope behind me on my 1022, and this is going to represent a rifle scope that might be great for plinking. This is a rimfire specific scope, so it's awesome for plinking, just having fun, but probably not a great option for precision rimfire competitions. And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll understand why. The magnification range is quite narrow. It's seven, uh, two to seven times magnification. It's a second focal plane and it doesn't have turrets that track extremely well and they're not readily accessible because they're under caps. But that's kind of what this scope rep represents, something that's really awesome and fun to shoot, but not great for competition. And this scope here on my centerfire bolt gun, this is the Viper HST. This is going to represent another really high quality, um, nice scope option, but not great for precision rimfire competition because of the feature set. Um, it's a second focal plane scope and some other smaller issues again that hopefully you'll understand by the end of this video. I'm going to use the Diamondback Tactical here to start off and talk about some of the features that you probably want to look for when you're looking at what scope to buy. Okay, so the first feature I'm going to talk about is first focal plane versus second focal plane. In my opinion, this is basically a no-brainer. If you can, you want to try and get a first focal plane scope. I don't want to get into the nuances and all the differences between FFP and SFP because that's going to take way too long, but for the end user, for the competitor, what this means is a first focal plane scope, the reticle will shrink and grow with the image as you change the magnification. So what that means for the shooter is it doesn't matter what magnification you're on, as long as you can see the reticle markings clearly, you can use those markings for your holdovers. 
a second focal plane scope like this Viper HST, that reticle will stay the same size as you move your magnification. So it doesn't adjust the size of the reticle with your image, which means if you're not at the calibrated magnification, which in this case is 16 times magnification, those holdover markings are not going to be correct. Now you can use it in different magnifications if you really understand the reticle to the fullest and you can do some quick math in your head. but. When you're under the clock and you're in a match, it's really not ideal. So it is possible to use an SFP scope, but FFP is definitely the way to go. So the second thing you would probably wanna look at in a rifle scope is the magnification range. There's a little bit of personal preference involved in this because different people like to shoot using different magnification, but just make sure that the range makes sense for what you wanna do with your scope. Make sure that on the lower end, you can crank it down in order to perhaps acquire your target quicker, and then you can crank it up if you'd like um, I've been trying to use less and less magnification in matches, so I find anywhere between 12 and 14 times magnification is kind of where I'm set now to shoot most matches with. It's a good magnification because it, it's large enough where the reticle, I can still see the markings clearly and read the numbers nice and clear, but it's not so zoomed into my target where the field of view is constricted and I can't look at different signs to uh, make wind calls and such. However, that being said, I do like my scopes to have generally more than 20 times magnification if I'm shooting groups or if I'm shooting something much further. I like to be able to zoom in when I need to. So this here, Diamondback Tactical, this is the six to 24 times magnification model. Again, I'm not usually shooting above the 20 times magnification very often, but I like to have it as an option if I need to. And this Strike Eagle is a five to 25 times magnification. So I think both on the lower ends around six times magnification works really nicely if you wanna acquire your target very quickly and get on that target but you can zoom up if you need to. Something again like this Diamondback here, which has the two to seven times magnification is gonna be really lacking. A lot of people will run scopes that max out at 16 times magnification, and I think that's totally adequate if that's something that works for you. Again, I just like to have something that has a little bit more magnification in the scope. Okay, so the next thing you wanna look at is the glass clarity in your scope. Basically, you don't need the highest end scope with the best class in order to shoot competitively, especially in precision rimfire, because the distances aren't as uh, long as a centerfire competition. So, for example, 99% of your rimfire competitions will be under 250 yards, which means you don't need super crystal clear glass in order to see your targets really well at that distance and still be able to spot your hits. So, in my opinion, if you can see your target clear enough, if you can make out what the wind is doing in the background and stuff, and if you can still spot your hits with your scope, the glass is clear enough and you're not gonna have a significant advantage over something that's much nicer. Keep in mind too, the different price points in scopes is very significantly affected by the glass quality in that rifle scope. You might have a lot of the same features and same quality in the features in two scopes, but if one has much higher end glass, it's gonna be astronomically more expensive. That's just the way it is. Obviously, the rule of diminishing returns is very apparent in rifle scopes as it is in anything else, but glass is that one key factor that really does pump up the price in a scope really quickly. As I mentioned before, as long as you can do those things, spot your hits, see your target clearly, and see environmental factors clearly, you really don't need glass that is astronomically more expensive in order to do so and to be competitive in these matches with. So something like the Diamondback Tactical, in my opinion, up to 200 yards, it's more than adequate to see all those things you need to see, which again, doesn't give you a huge um, disadvantage over someone using something really high end. If you're gonna be shooting further distances, if you're doing really ELR stuff, shooting your rim fires out to 500 yards and whatnot, the glass clarity might become a little bit lacking, especially at the higher magnification ranges, the, the image in the Diamondback Tactical starts to get washed out a bit. So you might want to think about getting something with a little bit higher glass clarity than the Diamondback Tactical. But again, for the majority of comp competitors out there, I think the glass in the Diamondback Tactical is good enough, even though it's not the best glass on the market. The Strike Eagle here has significantly better glass than the Diamondback Tactical and it would be a really good option if you're shooting a little bit further, you know, out past 250 yards regularly. That's not to say the Diamondback Tactical can't do it. It can do it, just not as well. So you really have to kind of find that sweet spot in terms of your budget and what you're looking for uh, in terms of what you wanna do with your rifle. Okay, so the next thing you wanna look for is a target style reticle in your scope. 
Um, a very common feature you'll see is what people like to call a Christmas tree style reticle. So it has both holdovers for your elevation and wind in the lower half of your reticle. I really like to see these in my um, scopes for precision rimfire. The Diamondback Tactical here, as well as the Strike Eagle, both feature that, which is great. They work really nicely. Again, sometimes depending what stage you're shooting, if you're shooting a lot of consecutive targets at different uh, distances, it might make more sense to use your reticle instead of dialing in each shot. And there's also stages I've seen which don't allow you to dial and force you to use your reticle for holdovers. So obviously a good target style reticle is great for that. Something that's like in the HST could still work. It doesn't have the Christmas tree on the bottom half, but it still has markings on both axes of the of the crosshair, but not as ideal. Again, you want to generally look for a target specific reticle. All right, so we're gonna go on to the turrets now. In a rifle scope you'll be using for precision rimfire competition, there's a few different things you wanna look for in your turrets. First off, how do they feel? If they don't feel good to you and you think you might misdial with the turrets, probably look at something else because in these types of competitions, you, you will be dialing quite a bit. And um, again, the Diamondback Tactical, in my opinion, has totally adequate turrets. There is a bit of mush in between each click, but because it's only six mils per rotation, the clicks are pretty well spaced apart and I've never had an issue misdialing or getting confused about which uh, marking I'm on. I think these turrets are more than adequate. Um, but again, a little bit of personal preference involved if you're used to shooting much higher end glass that have really nice feeling turrets, that Diamondback Tactical might um, not be up to your standards. But for me and a lot of other shooters, I think this is totally fine. The Strike Eagle here has a little bit more premium feeling turrets in my opinion. Um, but again, still totally adequate and I've never missed out or anything like that. More importantly though, in my opinion, is whether or not the turrets track consistently, accurately, and reliably. This isn't something you can test out in a store. Say you're at Cabela's and you're looking at a rifle scope. You can't just hold this up and turn it a few times and tell if your reticle is moving reliably and consistently and all that. This is where talking to other shooters, reading online reviews, and getting a little bit of additional information that way is definitely beneficial because you can only test the tracking of your turrets once you have it in person, and that might be a little bit too late. So definitely spend a little bit of money to get turrets that track consistently and reliably on your scope because that is a huge value in shooting competition. If your turrets don't track properly, really nothing else matters and you probably want to look at a different option. All right, so the next feature you want your rifle scope to have is an adjustable parallax, but more importantly for precision rimfire specifically is seeing whether that parallax can be adjusted down to the yardages that you'll be shooting at on the closer end of things. So for me, shooting ORPS, stages, they go down to 25 yards. So I wanna make sure that a rifle scope that I'm using has a parallax adjustment down to a minimum of 25 yards. But I think NRL 22 has some stages that are even closer shooting at tiny targets. I think they're like 10 to 15 yards. And not all rifle scopes have a parallax adjustment that can go down to those closer yardages. And that's something that I think is really quite important. I don't wanna to speak too in depth about what parallax error is in this video, because it's again, gonna to take too much time. But in a quick uh, nutshell, I guess, what parallax Relax error is again to the end user to the shooter is if you don't have a perfect cheek weld every time you're looking through your scope the reticle will move on the target you can see this if you wiggle your head behind your scope if you see your reticle moving on target and you're keeping your rifle still that's parallax error and that's what you're adjusting out when you're adjusting your parallax setting essentially you're putting your the reticle image and your target image in the same plane so that they stick together so it doesn't matter if your eye moves a little bit the reticle will stay on target again that's just parallax error in a very quick uh, nutshell but if you can't adjust your parallax down far enough you will introduce parallax error into your your sight and um, it won't be as easy for you to hit things as reliably now the top end of a parallax adjustment knob is almost always infinity so that is not an issue again it's the lower yardages you want to look for for example this diamondback tactical has a yardage marking of 10 and it actually goes down past that which is great for precision rimfire and the strike eagle here has a parallax setting that goes down to uh, 15 so again really good options for precision rimfire because of that 
the Viper HST here has a parallax setting down to 50. It does go a bit past that, but again, probably not great because you're gonna be shooting quite often at at uh, targets below 50 yards away. Now, something like this guy here, which is a rimfire specific scope, does not have a parallax adjustment. And this is gonna go for any scope that has fixed parallax. If you don't have an ability to adjust your parallax and really dial in to the distance you're shooting at, a lot of the rimfire scopes that are specific to rimfire will have a fixed parallax adjustment at say 50, sometimes 70 yards. But if you're shooting things 250 yards away with your rimfire, you're gonna be looking at a very blurry sight picture and you're gonna have a lot of parallax error in that system. Okay, so the next thing I have here in my necessary category is actually nothing to do with the scope, but rather the scope base. And that's trying to find something that has built-in cant. This Area 419, um, base has 30 MOA built into it, which essentially means half a degree of cant downwards. What this allows you to do is it still allows you to zero your rifle scope at 50 yards, but it saves some of your top end adjustments so that you can still dial your reticle a little bit higher than what you would normally be able to do if your scope base was just flat with zero MOA and no cant built into it. I actually have a 55 MOA base coming in the mail for my Strike Eagle here, which will cant the scope downwards almost at a full degree of cant, which if you imagine this on a rifle, means that the rifle has to be tilted more upwards to zero. And again, it saves a lot of that high-end, um, top-end elevation in my turret. What I'm trying to do with my Strike Eagle is I'm trying to have this thing zeroed at 50 yards. Hopefully I can still do it if I did my math right. I can take out the zero stop, which limits my top-end travel just in the Strike Eagle, just the way it's designed, so that I can have a full, um, almost 30 mils of adjustment upwards when this thing is still zeroed at 50 yards. So that's why I'm waiting for my 55 MOA base. But I would say if you're shooting NRL 22 and ORPS stuff, um, 20 MOA is good enough. But if you want a little bit more, it doesn't hurt as long as you can still zero your rifle in at your preferred distance. I usually do it at 50 yards. Okay, so we're gonna go on to the next category of features, which are things that I think are really nice to have and might be beneficial to your shooting experience, but definitely not critical and not a necessity in order to be very competitive in shooting precision rimfire. So the first thing I have here is a throw lever. Again, this is a bit personal preference. I know a lot of shooters that shoot very well that don't use a throw lever, lever but I think I like them because I do change my magnification quite often in a match. As I have alluded to before, generally, um, I'll start with a fairly low magnification, maybe around you know eight times or something like that, uh, just so that I can acquire my target a lot quicker. The range I shoot at with the ORPS series um, is really hard sometimes to quickly acquire your target because our target stands are a little bit low to the ground and the grass can grow really high and it just makes finding your target a little bit more difficult. So having a nice low magnification makes that really easy. And uh, when I'm actually shooting my, my targets, I like to crank it up a bit, both to see the target a little bit more clearly as well as having the reticle expand a little bit bigger so I can use those holdover markings more effectively. So I think a throw lever makes that um, process a lot easier. It's just this big, um, protrusion out of your magnification ring that you can just grab, crank it up, and you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to have your hands slip on the ring if it's raining or in the winter if you have gloves on. The lever is just much easier to manipulate that, that uh, ring with. The second thing I have here is a bubble level. Now, if you're shooting out to probably even 200 yards, it's not critical, especially if you have a pretty good understanding of when your rifle is fairly straight. The further you shoot, uh, I'm talking, you know, beyond 200 yards with a rimfire rifle, the more critical it is to have your your rifle plumb to your scope so that your tracking stays the same and consistent. Here on my Strike Eagle, I have a Burris anti-cant bubble level, which I think works really nicely. And on my wife's rifle here, there's a little bubble level built in the, into the Area 419 base, which she can use if she needs to. 
And the last feature in the nice to have list is a zero stop. Again, a little bit of personal preference. Some people might consider this a necessity, but if you've trained yourself and you're pretty good at, in, at dialing your turret back to zero after every stage, I don't think a zero stop is necessary. And if you can set up your system with enough cant in your rifle scope, you can actually just take out a zero stop um, out of the equation because you you want to try and set it up so that you don't have a full rotation below your zero anyway so that you save as much top end travel as possible and in that case again you obviously won't need a zero stop <clears throat> the strike eagle here does have a zero stop and i am running it at the moment but when i get my 55 moa base there is definitely not going to be enough travel below my zero for a full rotation so i can probably just pop that out and the way the strike eagle is designed the zero stop actually limits your top end travel but since i won't be able to or i won't need to use it i can take it out and have my full uh, 30 mils of adjustment above my zero which is quite nice okay so let's go on to the situational category i don't want to spend too much time on this because i have a feeling this video is going to be pretty long but the first one is locking turrets now, the Diamondback Tactical doesn't have locking turrets, the Strike Eagle does. Does that matter? For me personally, it does not. But again, it depends on your situation. If your matches require you to walk a significant distance between each stage, it might be pretty beneficial, especially for the windage turret, because that is more likely to get snagged on something if you're putting it in a bag or perhaps going up on a barricade. The windage turret is definitely more susceptible to being knocked off zero. So having a locking turret could be beneficial. Me personally, not a huge deal. The second thing is illumination. Pretty self-explanatory. If you need it, you need it. I've never been behind my rifle in a match and thought to myself that I wish I had illumination. So the Strike Eagle has it, but I don't think you really have to spend any extra money to acquire this feature for precision rimfire matches in general, unless you're doing night shoots or something like that. All right, the next situational item here is a sunshade. You can see I do enjoy running sunshades on a lot of my scopes. If you're familiar with my channel, you'll probably notice I usually just leave my sunshades on my scopes and just shoot them all the time. Uh, a few different reasons for that. A, I just don't lose them. And B, if I do need the sunshade, it's already on my scope, ready to go. I also generally run my flip caps on my sunshades, so it's annoying if I have to you know, take them on and off in order to install that. Generally speaking, the stages, pardon me, the matches that I shoot are in the middle of the day when the sun is right above us, so it's not really to reduce glare. In the winter, it does help sometimes, but it's not a huge issue for me. The big thing for me is it gives me a little bit more area to put my little stickers to represent things that I like to show off. You know, I like stickers, but to each their own. You do need a sunshade and you don't have it. It's a bit unfortunate because the glare and the way um, that can affect your sight picture can be quite significant. So again, I like to just leave my sunshades on my scopes. What I really like about Vortex is if their scopes accept sunshades, they almost always come with it. So you don't have to find it after the fact, which is great. Just something to keep in mind if maybe your range faces a bad direction and you're shooting early in the morning or, you know, the sun is, is right at a bad angle, um, you might want to look at a scope with a sunshade. So the last thing I have here in my situational category are flip flip up caps or these little flippy caps you see. I like to run these on my competition rifles for a few different reasons, but I can see both pros and cons and it's just something you have to decide if it works for you. Between each stage, if we're not shooting at our club, we actually put our rifles down on the ground very close to the dirt or in the winter, the snow, whatever it might be. So having flip caps that you can just easily close when you're waiting between stages is very beneficial. Obviously you don't have dust and stuff blowing into your lens and making it all dirty. And when you're about to shoot a stage, I can just quickly uh, pop them open and just leave them on the rifle like that. So that's why I like them. A few downsides uh, with these flip up caps specifically, these are the cheaper Vortex caps, not the Defender series. I have had strong gusts of wind be a little bit distracting because these can kind of move and uh, you know just be distracting. So that's one downside. The Defender Series caps I have here on the Strike Eagle are much better. And if you're gonna be looking for high quality caps, I would definitely suggest looking at the Defenders over these. I think they're worth the money. First off, obviously they close all the same, but they have a much stronger spring in them, which is quite nice. Again, a strong gust of wind is a lot less likely to to make these distracting. And what I really like about these that these caps can't do is they lock 
down in the vertical position and basically stay there. Um, they're very secure, out of the way. They, they lie completely flat and they're not distracting at all. So I really like these caps, the Defender Series. Um, a little bikini style cover, again, is totally fine. Um, obviously the downside to these is you have to keep track of them. So if you go ahead and cap your scope, if you go to shoot a stage, you have to remove them. You know, you might put this in your pocket, but if you have to go prone on the stage, it might jab you. Or if you put all your body weight on it, you could damage the caps. So in my mind, I think the flip up caps are the way to go for a competition rifle. But again, a little bit of personal preference involved. Anyway, I have a feeling this video is going to be really long. So I want to just cap it off there. Hopefully this gives you a good rundown of the features you want to look for in a competition scope for precision rimfire. Um, again, I have to clarify that I'm not an expert and I'm not a very super experienced shooter, but I think a lot of people will agree with the points I've presented in this video. So keep these things in mind if you're looking for a scope to put on your setup. Again, the Diamondback Tactical is something that a lot of people will recommend and a lot of people shoot because it's just such a great value package and hopefully you understand why after watching this video. I actually realized that all four scopes I showed in this video are Vortex, but that was just kind of a uh, coincidence. I do have other scopes from different manufacturers, but I do have quite a few Vortex optics as well. Anyway, thanks for watching guys. If you have any questions as usual, I'll do my best to answer them and I'll see you guys in my next video.